There were lots of questions when it was announced, but Persona 5 Strikers came out to being one of the best Musou games. What makes it have this status? Well, let's dive into the show. The game itself had a rather interesting dev cycle as it traces back to when Vanilla Persona 5 came out. This was when the initial development had begun. It's funny, because when this was revealed with a teaser, it was known as Persona 5 S, which pretty much everyone thought it was a Switch port. This was back in April 2019, so, uh, well, I mean, at least the Switch port finally happened three years later, but anyways, when it got its full reveal, it was shown to be a Musou-style type game, where you would control your party and fight against tons of enemies on screen. This, at the time, was intriguing, but also did let some fans down as it seemed like it was a spin-off that did not have much to it. I mean, it showed some style, and even in the previews before the game came out, it had the amazing music we know very well. They even had a spot at the 2020 Game Awards, which, to me, showed just how far the series has gone up on people's radar. But there was one massive issue that took place during the time when the game came out. It came out in February 2020 in Japan first, and there would be a worldwide release at some point, but, you know, a certain thing happened in 2020 that caused it to be delayed. This way in particular was painful, because the game is out in Japan, and more than ever, trying to avoid spoilers is not easy to do. It's just a shame this did not get a worldwide release, since the timing could have been great. However, the game eventually did get a worldwide release in February 2021, and the consensus was, it was great. Nothing groundbreaking, but for what it was, it has its moments and still had that style despite the genre shift. The funny thing about the genre shift is that, originally Persona 5 Vanilla did have an early draft where the game was going to be action-based. Persona 5 Vanilla also had another early concept being traveling around the world. When we talk about the story of this game, you will see a similar concept that was implemented here instead. It's always neat how early concepts of older games actually make it somewhere else. The biggest thing for me was that this game was not just a random side game, this was a full-on sequel to Persona 5, and while we have had games that progress story bits like Arena, this was still a big deal. So, with this said, let's jump into the game itself. The game itself is an action role-playing Musou style game. The game takes place a few months after Persona 5, and while you could technically start here, knowing Persona 5 beforehand would help a lot. This video will also contain none or very tiny spoiler stuff, nothing outright plot related however. So if one wanted to jump in without much story stuff being talked about, have no worries. The story starts off with the main pro tag coming back with Morgana to LeBlanc, and seeing the group chat as one of the first things you see when hitting new game brings me back. It gives the reminder that even though they have gone away, they are still connected. They come back to LeBlanc and meet up with the group where they are going to go on a summer vacation together. Yeah, the original concept I mentioned earlier made it back here, although at a lower scale. While going around getting stuff ready using Emma, a few members encounter an idol known as Alice who gives them a keyword to enter. When this keyword is entered, the members end up, yep, they end up in an alternate version of Tokyo known as a jail, similar to Persona 5's palaces. They then encounter the shadow version of Alice who they find out is the monarch of the jail, again similar to the palace rulers from before. They also run into an AI known as Sophia who joins the group and fights off the shadows. Eventually, after going back with the rest of the group, they end up taking down Alice who is the first monarch and then the trip can begin at last. The Phantom Thieves go out together with Sophia and along the way you might meet some interesting people who want to help you out. I will not deny that the story in some areas does follow a lot of the same beats as before, like jails and monarchs basically being the same thing like palaces and the rulers. This being said though, the part that kept me going when playing was the characters. The game having this road trip was really cool since it did try to revamp the areas you would run around. Plus, the game finally gave a few characters some much needed screen time. So even though the story was not a massive hit for me, it's the characters that kept it going. Plus the new cast they brought in I like. If I had to give criticism for one thing, and again, trying to keep it as little story as I can, yeah, I walked away from this being let down by the villains. The villains in Persona 5, while I did not connect or did not enjoy all of them, most of them were either good or amazing, or at the minimum, memorable. If one were to ask me, oh, how do you feel about this monarch? I will be honest, I might not remember much, if at all. Because for me, it's about the journey with these characters and going on another adventure. If there is one thing that still keeps going in this game, it's the interactions with the group. I mentioned how some get more screen time here, but other things like quotes and combat being similar but new, or even going back to an old hideout spot. These things are small, yes, but they can make a difference. I mean, the big one for me is that Lavenza is still the attendant. No Igor in sight, however. I wonder where he may or may not be. I think my favorite interaction in the game, though, has to be before they go on the trip. We see the protag with Morgana, Ryuji, and An having ramen talking about how at the start, it was just them in the group. It honestly was at this point that I knew I was really going to like the interactions. So even with my issues with certain story things, at least there is this. Anyways, let's get into the gameplay of Strikers. With the genre change, one might think that there is non-stuff action, and while this did concern me before the game came out, what they did here was amazing. Of course, the game is very much a Musou style where you have a ton of enemies to fight off on screen at once. You do this by running around and doing normal attacks while dodging, 
You can use gun attacks as well with each character, though this costs ammo, and you won't get it back until leaving the jail. You also get access to using each character's special attack, and it's different for each one. For Joker, you can fire a few bullets quickly. For Ryuji, you can have it so you don't flinch. For Morgana, you can literally use the bus to run down shadows. It, seriously, this is actually a move that does damage. These attacks are known as Master Arts, and the more you use them, the more moves you can unlock. This means yes, during combat you can switch to your other members. I will not deny that I use certain members more than others to unlock abilities that I really want, but it's not bad trying to get them, especially if you have a favorite. When you switch to another member, you also increase a little gauge known as Showtime. You are encouraged to do this as normally the rate that it goes is slow, but with switching, it goes faster. When this gauge is filled up, you can activate it at any time to do big AoE damage to your enemies. It's ideal to do it quick as once the gauge is full, you won't be able to get any more for that character. One mechanic that has been brought over from Persona 5 is the weakness system. Enemies in the game can have various weaknesses and if you use them or get critical hits, eventually you will get an indicator to do an all-out attack which damages them and any enemies nearby. The best part about it in this game is you can do multiple all-out attacks quickly and jump from one to another. They even work on bosses which is great. For me, an amazing thing they kept was you can summon your Persona for moves like before, but when you summon, the action stops. This even works when you're trying to switch between Personas to find which move you need. They give AoE fields for them which means even if the one you need the target is out of range, depending on your move, all you need to do is just move the attack just a little bit, again, while the action is stopped. And if you play Persona games in general before, you'll recognize a lot of the move names. You got physical and magic moves while also having buffs and debuffs. During fights, you can also do one mores on enemies where you can follow up and keep attacking them. This is also tied with party members being on screen with an indicator to also follow up or just doing a move. If you do this, your party member does a move while also switching over to them. During battle, if one needs to heal but doesn't have SP, you can pause the action by going to the item menu to use whatever you want. SP items in this game are huge, so stocking up on them is ideal. So up until this point, a lot of it seems pretty standard and familiar. Yes, we have the Master Arts, which is new, but even that seems like a natural thing to have along with the regular attacking. Now where the game goes even farther is the environment itself. Throughout many battles you will have during the game, you will see many spots that you can jump to. These being objects you can use to perform special moves without using SP or HP, but dealing a tiny bit more damage in some way. Using a streetlight lets the characters spin around in an AoE to attack enemies around them. While going on scaffolding, you can slice it down and do a ton of damage to enemies while also getting to do all out attacks. The environment is your friend, so if you have the opportunity to use it, go for it as it will do a lot for you in the long run. Some of it even has elements of its own, so you can even hit weaknesses. This element right here is what makes Strikers stand out to me, being able to jump around the air and use the environment. Other elements that stay from before are getting EXP and Yen after battle. Yen is used to buy items and equipment. Another thing you could get after completing a battle is a new persona. Whenever you see a mask, it can be obtained. This means that negotiation is not a thing in this game, but oh well. At least once you get the persona, you can register it in the Velvet Room. Once again, the Velvet Room is here and you can fuse personas and recall old ones. Now because there is no confidant or social link system in the game, the best way to level them up is by enhancing. Throughout, you will be getting a currency known as PP and the more you get, the more you can level a specific persona of your choosing. This can be a little bit of a grind depending on what one needs, but it's better than nothing. Otherwise, the Velvet Room is just like before. You can pick what skills you want to inherit when fusing personas. Without confidence in the game, one might think, is there any bonding at all? Well, there is, known as the bond skills. In the game, you'll be getting points, and if you get enough, you will level up your bonds within the group. With these points, you can learn skills that'll help you in some way. Some help in battle, while others help outside of battle. And when going through the game, you unlock more. The ways you level up bond is by advancing the story, doing requests, and more. One more thing to note, however, is that the game's EXP share is not generous, so it's best to rotate members when you can. I mean, it is a nice way of trying them out. Battling is not the only thing you'll be doing in the game. Just like in Persona 5, you do go through the jails themselves. Whenever you go through them, there will be enemies around and if you get close, you engage them in combat. You can get an ambush on them to get a head start however. If you are jumping around the area, it makes it easier to do this. Observing the area with third eye also helps. One type of shadow that doesn't show on third eye are the desire shadows. These ones are very difficult. You have to wait a while before fighting them since they have a ton of wild moves they can do. When it comes to the actual exploring of the jails, you mainly follow a set path completing the objectives given. I give credit that they try to go the route of this since it would have been easy to just have it be fighting the whole time. Most of the time you are running around, occasionally you will come across unavoidable fights but nothing too wild. While going through them you get checkpoints which means if you need to exit the jail for whatever reason, you can get back quick. Exiting a jail by the way gives you full SP which is very nice. In this game there is no advancing time either, the time is mainly there for the story. The one segment I don't like in jails is the defending Futaba ones. These boil down to defender while she's hacking for X amount of time. These are not the worst thing ever, but it's not that good. 
Plus, you can get caught off guard really quick, which means you would have to do it again. Not fun, but could be worse, I guess. One more thing with the jails. When you complete them, you can go back to them later. When it comes to it, that is basically it for the jails. Along the way, you will find treasures and loot to sell, but it's a lot like before in a lot of ways. Other stuff you can do in the game is exploring the real world. During the trip, you will visit many locations and admire the scenery. You know, even though there's not much running around in these areas, it's still nice knowing they made all of this. While exploring these areas, you will find shops where you can buy items and as mentioned before, SP items are crucial to have. If you have the end, it's good to buy all the SP ones just in case something happens. If one is worried that the stock has run out, all you have to do is a few battles in a jail and the items will be back. This is honestly something I wish I knew when I first played because it would have helped out so much. One major shop you can buy stuff from is Sophia's shop. This you can do anytime in the real world. This also happens to be the only shop that has equipment you can buy. You can also cook in the real world and this is used to make items as well. Some shops in the game have ingredients you can buy and these can make some very nice items. Around the areas you will be at, you can also talk with your team to see if they have any requests. The ones that are centered around your team are missable so that is something to note. Before leaving for the next area, the game does give you a heads up on that. Not bad per se if you don't do them, but it is something it mentions to you when playing. When it comes to the side stuff in Strikers, you mainly have the requests to do. Some of these contain being enemies with certain objectives, others are fusing personas with certain moves and more. Talking about other stuff of course leads to the music of the game. Once again, another Persona game, another great soundtrack. There are some remixes of previous songs like Last Surprise which are good, but then new ones that also sound amazing. It does help out the game giving it that new feel with the music, and it's not just battles, there is new exploring music as well. Many were wondering how Persona 5 Strikers was going to turn out, and I think it's safe to say it did good. Not my favorite game ever, but as a follow-up to Persona 5, I think it's good stuff. I still say my favorite spin-off is Persona 4 Arena Ultimax, but who knows, maybe someday there will be one that beats it. But right now, Persona 5 Strikers is a pretty great Muso game. I finally did a follow-up to my Persona 5 Royal video at long last. If you like this video and want to see more, check out the other videos on the channel. Thank you for watching and I will see you on the next video.